Communication signals are often modeled using complex numbers. And for that reason, we have this background video, which is discussing complex numbers, both in scalars and vectors, and finally in matrices, and how we can manipulate these ones in matrix analysis. Let us start with talking about real numbers, the regular type of numbers that we are used to, anything from minus infinity to plus infinity, any number of that kind. And they are all belonging to the real valued set of numbers or real space. And suppose we take two numbers, A and B, that comes from this real set. And then we are defining what we call the imaginary unit, which is equal to the square root of minus one. Well, then we have an additional type of numbers that we call the imaginary numbers. These are when we take a real number, multiply it with the imaginary unit, then we get an imaginary number. And we can create a complex number by taking A plus B multiplied with J, the imaginary unit. And notice here that in electrical engineering, we are using J to denote the imaginary unit, while in many mathematical frameworks, we are considering I instead. But I is the current in electrical engineering, so that's why J is used instead. So if we take A plus J, B, then we have a real part, we have an imaginary part, and the sum of these things is called a complex number. And we have then taken the real set, the imaginary set, and together we are getting all the complex numbers of this kind. And that is what we denote with a C, like this. Since the complex numbers have two dimensions, a real part and an imaginary part, we can draw it in a two-dimensional way like this, with the real part along the horizontal axis, the imaginary part along the vertical axis, and then C in this case have A as its real part, B as its imaginary part, and therefore it's this point here. This representation of a complex number with the real part and a imaginary part is called the Cartesian form. There is another form, that is also very common, the polar form. And that is based on dividing C into two other types of objects. The magnitude, which is the length of this line here from the origin up to C. So this is also known as the absolute value. And the argument that is described in this angle here from the real axis. And you can represent any complex number either in the Cartesian form or in the polar form there is a one-to-one -one mapping. And for example, the magnitude can be computed using the Pythagorean relationship as a square plus b square, and then taking a square root. Let us now have a look at some basic calculations with complex numbers. We have two numbers here, a plus jb and x plus jy. We multiply these two numbers together. So we have the parentheses here with the first number, the parentheses here with the second number. And now we can just expand this expression, so we take a times x, we take j, b times j, y, we have it here, I write j square here, and then we have a times j, y over here, and j, b, x, that's what we have over here. And j square, well, if you remember that j was defined as a square root of minus one, well, then this becomes minus one as well, so we can replace this with minus one. When performing calculations with complex numbers, it's common to consider the complex conjugate. If you have a complex number C, which is A plus JB, then the conjugate, which is C star, is what we get when we are just switching the sign of the imaginary part. So we can look at it like this. We have the real part, we have the imaginary part, we have C over here, and then C star or the complex conjugate of C is what we get when we are flipping this one down. So we have a negative number in this case along the imaginary axis. Let's now compute C times C conjugate. So this expression here, A plus JB, and then we remember that C star was A minus JB. And if we are multiplying these things together once again, we get A times A, that's A squared, we get j b times j b with a minus here. So we get plus b square because we have a minus here and then j times j is also minus one. And then we have the cross terms, j b times a, that is this expression, and a times minus j b, that is this expression. And the two red marked expressions here, they are the same except for a minus sign, which means that they are canceling out. We have no imaginary part left here. We just get a square plus b square. 
Now we can remember that the magnitude of C was exactly the same thing, just with the square root. So this is actually the magnitude squared of C. So this is a one way of computing the magnitude of C. We multiply C with this conjugate, and then we take the square root of it. There is another way of interpreting the complex conjugate. We can also start from the polar form when we had the magnitude here, and then we have e to the power of j arg of c. And in this case, when we are applying our conjugate, well, we are taking the argument, which was this angle, and then we are flipping it downwards instead. So we're just adding a, a additional minus sign here. So this is another way of computing the complex conjugate, and now it also becomes rather clear that if we multiply c and c conjugate together, well, we get the magnitude squared, and then we get e to the power of j arc c minus j arc c. Those two arguments are cancelling out, so we only get the magnitude of c squared left. Most of the things that we can do with real numbers can also be done with complex numbers. For example, we can define a vector containing m different complex entries like this. So this is a m-dimensional vector, we call it x, and the element we call them x1 to xm. A common way of representing vectors is by drawing an arrow from the origin to the point that is the x here. And say that we have two dimensions, first entry here, second entry here, well then if this is the point x, well then it's this black arrow here that is representing our vector. Note that this is just one geometric way of illustrating the vector. Actually, the first dimension here is complex value, the second dimension is complex value, so it's not formally speaking just one dimension that we can draw like this, but it still shows you the idea that there is a complex vector space where we have a vector, which is a point, and we can draw it as an arrow from the origin to that point. We can, as usual, take vectors and separate them into two different parts the length of the vector, and the direction of the vector. So this is what we can show here. The length is what we are getting if we are taking a ruler and measure from the origin up to the point x, and we are writing it with this double line notation. This is known as the norm of x, and it's essentially a generalization of the magnitude of a scalar number. Here is also describing the length of something. And then we have the direction. This is a vector. The red one here, pointing in the same direction as x, but it has a length 1. Uh, so we can essentially take the original vector x and divide it with its norm, and in that way we get a length 1 vector pointing in the same direction. The norm of a vector is computed in a similar way as the Pythagorean relationship. We take each dimension, we take its absolute value square, we add them up for 1 to m, and then we are taking the square root. So that is how you compute the norm of a vector. And we can also write it with the summation sign, like this. And since we are dealing with complex vectors here, it's very important that we have this magnitude operation at each of the elements as well. What I call a vector here is also known as a column vector, because it's a matrix with only one column. And when we are dealing with matrices, there is something known as the transpose. If we take a transpose, of a vector or a matrix, what we are doing is that we are just flipping the dimensions. So if we have one column here, then we have one row, and we are keeping exactly the same elements, x1 to xm. And we write this with xt here for transpose. And this is what you probably have seen in linear algebra courses from before. But when we are dealing with complex valued vectors, there is other things that we can do as well. The first thing is to compute the complex conjugate of the vector, x star. And that is the same thing as taking every element in the vector and computing its complex conjugate. And finally, there is something known as the conjugate transpose, or also the Hermitian transpose. And for that reason it's written like x and then the superscript h. And that means that we are taking both the conjugation and the transpose. So we first take every element and replace it with this complex conjugate, and then we take this column and turn it into a row. Among these three different operations, actually the conjugate transpose is the most common one when we are dealing with a complex vector. So if you're in MATLAB, it's trying to compute the transpose, it's typically doing a conjugate transpose for you. And maybe you have only done it with real valued vectors from before, but if you put in a complex valued vector, well, this is the conjugate transpose that you will actually get.
A reason why the conjugate transpose is appearing a lot is that if you compute a inner product of two vectors, it's part of the definition. So say that we have x and y, and we would like to compute its inner product. Then we take x conjugate transpose times y, which is the same thing as taking a summation over all of the elements. Suppose these are vectors of length m. Well, then we take a summation over all of the elements. For the mth one, we are taking xm with the conjugate multiplied with ym. So this is the inner product. One reason for computing inner products between vectors is to determine how similar these vectors are. And there is something called a cauchy swatch inequality that is measuring this. So if we take the inner product, we compute its absolute value. Well, then it's smaller or equal to the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second vector. So it can never be larger than this number. There can be a quality in this expression that happens precisely when x and y are parallel, which means that x is equal to c, which is a complex scalar multiplied with y. So let me show you this. x is this vector here pointing in a particular direction, and then the value of the inner product, particularly its absolute value or magnitude, will depend on in which direction y is pointing. If y is pointing in the same direction, well, then there are parallel vectors and we get the maximum value from this inner product, from the cauchy schwarz inequality. If y is the red vector here, well, then they are orthogonal, which means that if you compute their inner product, it's precisely zero. So that is the lower bound that we can get here. And the green one here will provide it with some number in between. And when you are dealing with real valued vectors, well, then one could uh, say that the difference between here is the angle here between them, but we can't really define it exactly that way when we are dealing with complex vectors, but we can still think about it like that. And if we are taking the inner product between x and itself, like this, then we get the summation over xm conjugate times xm. This is the absolute value square, and actually this is the same thing as computing the norm and then squaring it. So this way of computing the squared length of the vector resembles a lot how we could compute the length of a complex number uh, by taking the conjugate of it and multiply with itself. A vector is a matrix with just one column. And in general, we can define complex matrices like this. Say that we have M times K matrix. That means that we have a matrix with M rows and K columns. That is how we always are writing it. The elements are written like this. Gm1 means that this is the nth row and first column. Gmk means that it's the nth row and kth column. And all of the elements are written with subscripts like that. When we have an m times k matrix, we can compute its transpose by flipping it over its diagonal. So now we have k rows and m columns instead. And we can see that here we have element G1K in the lower left corner, and it was in the upper right corner before. And we can compute the conjugate transpose by doing both the transpose and the conjugate operation. So it's the same as GT here, but with the conjugate on every element. There are special types of matrices that have special names. A square matrix is a matrix that have the same number of columns as rows. So in the previous example, I have an M times K matrix, if M and K are the same, it's a square matrix. One particular type of square matrices are diagonal matrices. So D is a diagonal matrix of size M if it contains D1 to DM along its diagonal and all the other elements are zero. And we will sometimes use this dike D1 to DM short form for a matrix like this. One particularly common form of diagonal matrix is the identity matrix, which has ones along its diagonal. If it's an M by M matrix, then we write it like this, I M. So this is only ones along the diagonal. Square matrices have some particularly interesting properties. And uh, we will start by looking at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if you have an M by M matrix, then a non-zero vector U is called an eigenvector of A, if we can compute a times u, so we multiply them together, and then we get u again, but with a scaling factor, a scalar here, which can be complex valued. And we call this the eigenvalue corresponding to u. And if we have found one u, then uh, we can scale it. So we have something pointing in the same direction, but with a different length, and then we will get another eigenvector of the same kind, having the same eigenvalue. There are always precisely m eigenvalues to an m by m matrix. However, some of them might 
have the same value, and some of them might be zero. The rank of a matrix is defined as the number of linearly independent columns that that matrix is having. This is often equal to the number of non-zero eigenvalues that the matrix is having, counting that some eigenvalues might appear multiple times, but it's not always like that. If you would like to find eigenvalues, well, what you first do is that you are taking this expression here, rewrite it as a minus lambda times an identity matrix, like this. And then that should be multiplied with u. And if you would like to find an eigenvector, well, then you compute the determinant of that equated to zero. And then you find an eigenvalue by solving for lambda. And as a next step, we are taking that particular lambda value. And we compute a minus lambda times the identity matrix. We multiply with a arbitrary u. We equate it to zero. And then we are solving this equation here for u. And then we are finding an eigenvector up to a scaling factor. An interesting thing with square matrices is that we can often decompose them based on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So say that we take A here and it has M linearly independent eigenvectors. We put them as columns of U here and say that they are unit norm eigenvectors. And then we are taking D, which is a diagonal matrix containing the corresponding eigenvalues in the same order along the diagonal. Then A can be written as this matrix U multiply with d, and then multiply with u with an inverse. This is known as the eigenvalue decomposition of A, and it allows us to turn the matrix A into a diagonal matrix by shuffling around the order of expressions here. So say that we are taking uh, this expression, we multiply with u inverse from the left, and u from the right. Well, then we get u inverse u, which cancel out each other and u inverse u on the other side, that also cancels out, that becomes an identity matrix. And therefore, we get this expression where we can transfer A to a diagonal matrix, only containing the eigenvalues. Geometrically speaking, this means that we are taking the matrix A, and we are changing the coordinate system that we're representing it with to being the eigenvectors. And then we are getting D here as the equivalent representation of the matrix in this new coordinate system. The eigenvalue decomposition is particularly simple for Hermitian matrices. These are square matrices that are symmetric in the sense that if you take the conjugate transpose of them, well, then we are getting the same thing. In this case, it turns out that A can be written as U, D, U, Hermitian transpose. So what does it mean? Well, in this case, U is uh, containing the eigenvectors just as before, but now this matrix turns into what is known as a unitary matrix, which means that all of the eigenvectors are not only linearly independent, but orthogonal to each other. So if we take an inner product between two of them, it becomes zero. So that means that U Hermitian is actually the inverse of U, and this holds for all so-called unitary matrices. And we can now diagonalize A by multiplying with U Hermitian from the left and U from the right, and then we get this D matrix with the corresponding eigenvalues. The eigenvalue decomposition also allows us to write A in this form as a summation over the M eigenvalues. For each one of them, we take the eigenvalue, we multiply it with the eigenvector, and then with the eigenvector with the Hermitian transpose on it. This is an outer product. And we sum this up and in this way we're getting the matrix back. In this video we have talked about complex numbers, which are very useful when describing communication signals. And we've also talked about complex vectors and matrices, which are very important in multiple antenna communications in order to describe a multitude of antennas. And finally we talked about absolute values or magnitudes or norms or eigenvalue decompositions, which are very important in order to describe the single strength in different directions when we are dealing with multiple antennas.